Selamat sore dan terima kasih sudah bergabung dengan kami di hari Sabtu ini. Uh, and that means good afternoon everyone and thank you so much for joining us and spending your Saturday with us again. For those of you who attended the, the last three sessions, welcome back and uh, we're so happy to, 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 to see you again uh, this afternoon. And today we had more than, actually more than 3,000 people who have registered for the webinar. So, uh, I am confident that we'll have a full house again today. Uh, we have had a very successful three webinars uh, the last three weeks. And uh, the first one, if you recall, is uh, on teaching multimodal literacy. And the second one was on improving proficiency using extensive reading and listening. And uh, last week we had Rod Alice and Francisca Yvonne talking about task and project-based learning in ELT. The recordings are available. For those of you who missed the sessions, the recordings are available in the British Council uh, YouTube uh, channel. And today is very, very special. We have two renowned second language writing scholars, Ken Highland and Aisi Lee, who will be talking, will be sharing their thoughts about uh, the teaching of second language writing. Uh, before we begin, ladies and gentlemen, let me just uh, remind you of a couple of housekeeping matters. The uh, session today is recorded and also live streamed on the British Council Indonesia YouTube channel. Uh, I would like to encourage you to ask questions during and also after the sessions. And please put your questions in the Q&A uh, box in the Zoom room and the chat section on YouTube. Uh, the uh, chat box on Zoom is open for general comments and very, very soon we are going to disable the uh, chat function so that you can focus your attention on the uh, uh, presentations by the two speakers. At the end of today's session, you will be able to download your e-certificate and also the uh, PDF slides of the uh, uh, speakers today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are about ready to begin now. The first speaker is going to be Professor Ken Highland. Let me just briefly introduce him. Uh, he is a visiting professor at the University of East Anglia, UK. He was previously a professor at University College London, the uh, University of East Anglia, and also the University of Hong Kong. He is best known for his research into writing and 
academic discourse, having published, is that true? 280 articles, is that true, Ken? That's a lot of articles. And 29 books on topics related to writing and academic discourse. Uh, and that has generated nearly 70,000 citations on Google Scholar. A collection of his work was published as The Essential Highland uh, by Bloomsbury 2018. Uh, he is also very actively involved in editing, uh, you know, journals and uh, also books. He was founding co-editor of the Journal of English for Academic Purposes and was also co-editor of Applied Linguistics. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor uh, Ken Highland. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Willie, for that um, for that introduction. Um, thanks everybody for coming to my talk. It's nice to see so many of you, and um, thank you to the British Council for sponsoring the event and to uh, Professor uh, Willie for inviting me. Okay. I want to talk about uh, teaching writing um, because um, this is. I'm sorry. Um, I'm very sorry, I've got a technical hitch here. Not a problem. Um, which I will. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, I'd like to um, talk about teaching um, uh, writing, um, partly because this is one of the uh, few things that I know anything about, um, but also because um, I think it's one of the uh, um, most difficult, um, can you see my slide now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, because I think it's one of the most difficult things for teachers to teach and for uh, students to learn. Um, I want to present the key aspects of writing as different options, but it is possible to mix uh, and match them to some extent. Now, each focus assumes a different idea about writing and implies a different way of teaching it. So the first approach concentrates on the products of writing by examining texts. The second focuses on the writer and the processes used to create text, and the third emphasizes the role that readers play in writing, showing how writers think about an audience when they create text. Now, this is all very broad, but it's, I think, a useful way of discussing and evaluating some of the um, research and how it feeds into classrooms. And do you want First to all, share your slides again? Your slides are not showing. They're not showing. Uh, no. Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm having a real mare today. Um, the share screen button again, just like yeah, yeah. Are they showing now? Nope. Um. Is it showing now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, as I said, three approaches to um, uh, um, researching and teaching writing, um, focusing on text, on writers, or on readers. Now, the first approach um, focuses on uh, text. So, these see writing as an outcome, the uh, words on a page or on a screen. And uh, this is writing then as a noun rather than a verb. But um, 
there are two broad approaches to seeing texts um, as objects because, uh, sorry, texts as um, writing as text, because we can see them as objects or as discourse. So seeing texts as objects means understanding writing as the application of rules. So writing is a thing. It's independent of any particular context, writers or readers. And learning to become a good writer is largely a matter of knowing grammar. So this is what is often called a product approach. So this view sees text as the arrangement of words, clauses, or sentences, and students can be taught to say exactly what they mean by putting these together effectively. So in the classroom, what this generally means is that um, uh, learners study a text to understand its grammar and vocabulary. Then there's, uh, they manipulate fixed patterns, uh, often from substitution tables, then there's some kind of guided writing where they imitate model texts or fill in blanks, uh, complete texts and so on. And then there's a free writing where they get to learn, they get to use the, um, uh, the patterns that they've learned to write an essay, a letter or uh, a blog or whatever. But while this has been a major classroom approach for many years, it draws on the rather old fashioned and discredited idea that meaning is contained in the message and that we communicate we, that we transfer ideas from one mind to another through language. Now this behind, li, idea lies behind the conduit metaphor. Now basically the idea here is that the lady with the dark hair has an idea, she puts these into words and sends them through the conduit. In this um, example, it's writing. The lady with the fair hair receives the, the words um, and understands the exactly the same idea as the lady with the black hair. So meanings correspond with words and writing is transparent in reflecting meanings rather than as, as, as people creating them. So meanings can be written down and understood by anyone with the right encoding and decoding skills. A text says everything that needs to be said. So there's no conflict of interpretations, no reader positions, um, no different understandings. We all see things in um, exactly the same way and, and life is wonderful. But this doesn't make sense, of course, because accuracy is only one aspect of good writing and on its own, it doesn't create meanings. This is how lawyers make their money. They, they pick apart the most um, and dispute the most detailed and explicitly written contracts and documents. So our goal as writing teachers can never be just training students on accuracy, because all texts assume what readers will know and how they're going to use the text. The writer's problem then is not to make everything explicit, to make it, but make it explicit for particular um, readers, balancing what needs to be said against what can be assumed. So this model sees text as independent of real life users. And if we adopt it as teachers, we might mislead students into thinking that they only need to write accurately to be effective. Now, the second perspective um, as, uh, sees text as discourse. So the way that we use language to communicate to achieve purposes in specific uh, situations. So here, the writer is seen as having certain goals and intentions, and the ways that we write are resources to accomplish these goals. So instead of forms being independent of context, a discourse approach sees them as located in social actions. And teachers try to see the ways that, that texts work to communicate by linking language to uh, context and writer purposes. So a key idea here, of course, is that of genre. Um, this is really just a term for grouping texts together. So we know immediately, for example, whether a text is uh, a recipe, a joke, or a love letter. And we can respond to it and maybe even uh, write a similar one uh, if we, we need to. So we all have a, a, a menu of these uh, responses and we learn new ones as we need them. So genre reminds us that when we write, we follow conventions for organizing messages. And because we want our reader to understand our intentions. 
like the introduction body conclusion pattern that we probably learned to structure our essays in school, or the problem solution pattern, which underlies narratives. So here this usually opens with a contextualizing move, which introduces the players and the context. Then uh, a problem is introduced for the participants. This is followed by their response to the problem. And finally, there's an evaluation of the response. Was it successful? So genre approaches then describe the stages which help us to set out our thoughts in ways readers can easily follow. All genres have a social purpose, and the main goal of the narrative here is to entertain through storytelling. This is achieved in fairly conventional steps, usually with a genre. This is Jim Martin, and um, he calls genre a staged, goal-oriented activity. Um, so we can't achieve our goal in one jump, but we have to work towards it by stages. So two examples of this are the explanation and instruction genres. So the purpose of an explanation is to describe a process like uh, the water cycle or how something works, like a light bulb. This is an example is, is from um, an L1 primary student. And it, the structure is very simple. It consists of a general statement introducing the topic and then a series of logical steps explaining how or why something occurs. They're usually written um, with these features. There's uh, generalized participants using the timeless present, um, lots of temporal sequence connectors, next, then, after that, causal connectors, because, therefore, and it mainly uses action verbs, things happen. Now, instructions, on the other hand, are written to describe how something should be done. So they... Uh, usually consist of uh, a goal statement, what's to be achieved, a list of materials and equipment needed to achieve the goal, a series of sequence steps towards the goal, and diagrams, illustrations, and so on. Um, I, I should warn you that this is not an authentic text. I made it up. Um, I don't know how to bake, and um, if you eat these muffins, they will, they will kill you. So um, really, genres encourage us to, um, um, to, to look at the structure and the main features. Um, and the main features of instruction are we find chronological sequence, uh, very uh, direct, simple present or imperatives, simple sentences, um, signposting sequences, first, next, after that, and so on. And again, action verbs. So, Genres ask us to look for patterns and uh, to see how we create meanings. But what does it mean in the classroom? Well, for one thing, it means attending to grammar. But this is not the traditional grammar of the writing as object approach. Here, grammar is a resource for uh, producing text. And a knowledge of grammar here, the idea is that it shifts writing from what is implicit and hidden to something explicit um, and conscious to allow students to write effectively. Now in, con in class, this often involves getting students to notice and then use writing conventions to help them produce well-formed and appropriate texts. Um, this is often called uh, consciousness raising. And one approach widely used in Australia is the uh, teaching learning cycle, which looks like this. And the cycle helps us to plan classroom activities by showing genre learning as a series of linked um, stages which support learners towards understanding text. The key stages then are first of all, understanding the purpose of the genre and the settings where it's used. So how does it fit into workplace, social, academic, context, who writes it, who with, for whom, um, why is it written, um, what's the relationship between the writer and the reader, and so on. So we look at a text to see um, what writers are trying to achieve in a particular situation. The second step involves modelling the genre and analysing it to reveal its stages and its key features. So what are the main tenses? What kind of vocabulary does it use? And so on. And here teachers might get students to 
uh, sequence and label text stages or rearrange uh, scrambled paragraphs. The third stage involves a joint construction of the genre through guided teacher supported practice. So maybe students write a parallel text, um, perhaps uh, using um, a fairy tale, Cinderella from the perspective of the, of the bad sisters. Um, fourth is independent writing where students work alone, uh, monitored by the teacher. And finally, the teacher relates what's been learned to other genres uh, and context. So comparing perhaps what students know already and how it's linked to other genres that they know. So each stage then has a different purpose and draws on different uh, classroom activities. Students can enter the cycle at any stage, depending on what they already know about the genre, and genres can be recycled at more advanced levels. Um, it, more importantly, perhaps, the cycle provides scaffolded learning for students, supporting them through what Vygotsky calls the zone of proximal development. So essentially, what the difference between um, what students can do now and what they can do um, after instruction. Also, as students move around the cycle, direct teacher instruction is reduced. So teach, students get a lot of help at the beginning and they get, the students gradually gain more confidence and learn to write the genre on their own and teacher support is withdrawn. So autonomy increases as they gain greater control over the genre. Okay, all this looks wonderful, but of course, uh, genre has been criticized for stifling creativity and imposing models on students. So obviously there are risks here. Uh, teachers might teach genre as a kind of recipe uh, so that students get the idea that they can just pour their meanings in, into ready shaped uh, molds. But there's no real reason why providing students with an understanding of discourse should be any more prescriptive than providing them with a uh, description of the sentence or uh, the steps in a writing process. The point is that genres do constrain us. So that as soon as we decide that we're going to write um, a blog post or a lab report, then we will write within certain expected patterns. So the genre doesn't dictate what we write or, or determine how we write it. It enables choices to be made. And these choices um, uh, create meaning because we choose one option instead of another option. So genre theories then suggest that teachers who um, understand how texts are typically structured, understood and used is in a better position to intervene successfully in the writing development uh, of his or her students. Now, the second approach focuses on the writer rather than the text. Interest here is on what good writers do when they write so that they these can be uh, taught to um, L2 students. So writing is seen as a process through which we um, discover and reformulate our ideas as we write. So it's more of a problem solving activity. How can I express myself uh, rather than an act of communication? How can I uh, talk to my readers? So it's how people approach this writing task and, and solve it as a problem. Um, to explain how um, writers solve this problem, process theorists draw on the tools of cognitive psychology and artificial intelligence. So in this model, there's a memory, a central processing unit, uh, problem solving programs and flow charts. And this flow chart, I think, is, is probably well known by teachers. Um, it shows that writers don't create text by thinking, writing, editing, but they jump about between different stages. So what the, the um, uh, flow chart tells us is that uh, writers have goals and that they plan extensively that writing is constantly revised, uh, often in our heads before any text is put down on, on uh, at all, um, that planning, drafting, revising and editing are recursive and often simultaneous, and that plans and texts are, off, uh, are constantly evaluated um, by a writer in a kind of feedback loop of plan, uh, write, plan, write, plan. So the model advises teachers 
um, to assist writers through a writing process by encouraging uh, pre-writing tasks uh, like brainstorming and outlining um, to generate ideas. It encourages uh, several, uh, writing several drafts, uh, improving each one as they go. Uh, giving feedback on drafts, encouraging peer response and uh, responding to um, um, suggestions, um, to delay surface corrections and grammar changes until the end, until the final editing, and um, publishing the work, sharing it with others, so as a poster, a class uh, paper, website, or whatever. Now, this has been the dominant model in uh, many countries, particularly in the US, for many years. But students, I think, need language support as much as writing support to overcome their problems. So getting students to reflect on how they write, I don't think is going to improve what they write. So the influence of cognitive psychology rather than applied linguistics means teachers are concerned with what students think about when they write and not the language that they need to do it. And this creates four problems, I think, for me. First of all, by overemphasizing psychological factors, it neglects the importance of context and how that influences writing. So process focuses on the writer as an isolated individual struggling to express personal meanings. And so it tends to represent writing as a decontextualized skill. There's little understanding of the ways that language is used to, uh, in particular uh, domains or what it means to communicate in writing. But in fact, we very rarely just write. We always write for a purpose in a particular situation. And this involves variation in the ways that we write, um, not universal rules. So in other words, process models don't make, give us any help in understanding language, nor do they allow us to confidently advise students on their writing. Second, this is a discovery-based approach. It doesn't make the language that students need explicit for them. Students are not taught the structures of target types, but are expected to discover um, appropriate forms in the process of writing itself or from what teachers put in their um, comments uh, 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 during feedback. Now this might be okay for uh, uh, some first language students, but second language students often find themselves in what Amy Delpit calls an invisible curriculum. And she puts it very well when she says, adherence to process approaches um, to writing creates situations in which students ultimately find themselves held accountable for knowing a set of rules about which no one has ever directly informed them. Teachers do students no service to suggest, even implicitly, that product is not important. Students will be judged on their product regardless of the process that they use to achieve it. And that product, based as it is on the specific codes of a particular culture, is more readily produced when the directives of how to produce it are made explicit. The third problem, I think, with um, uh, the process approaches is um, it assumes that making the processes of expert writers explicit will make novice writers better um, writers. But not all writing is the same. It doesn't always depend on an ability to use universal context independent revision and editing processes. Exam writing doesn't involve multi drafting, for example, and a lot of professional academic writing is time constrained and um, uh, 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 um, collaborative. So different writing processes involve uh, different writing involves different processes. Finally, process models, I think, disempower teachers. So this is a model of writing based on personal freedom, um, self-expression, mm -hmm. learner responsibility, all of which might be crushed by too much teacher intervention. So this reduces, I think, the teacher to a well-meaning uh, bystander. The teacher assigns a task and gives feedback at the end. Because language and text organization are added on to the end of the process uh, as editing, rather than forming a central resource for constructing meanings, students are given no way of 
seeing how texts uh, are written for particular purposes and audiences. Uh, Chris Tribble sums up the criticism, while a process approach will certainly make it possible for apprentice writers to become more effective at generating texts, they, this may be to little avail if they're not aware of what their readers expect to find in those texts. Okay, the third um, uh, oriented um, orientation I want to mention is, is focusing on readers. I, I've been talking about seeing context as a site of writing, where, writer, where the writer is, what he or she is thinking of, and so on. The, this approach extends the idea of context beyond uh, the local writing situation to the reader's context, how writers imagine uh, their text will be understood and what they do to address the reader. So it asks a number of questions. So the student should think about who are they writing for? What's their relationship? Is it formal or informal, friendly or stranger? What does he or she already know? Is it an expert or a beginner? What does she, he or she believe? How will they understand your text? Will they agree with your ideas? So when we write, we choose our ideas, we choose our words to, to, to connect with others, to present our um, ideas in ways that make most sense to them. We try and draw readers in by our writing, to influence them, persuade them, entertain them, inform them in ways which sees the world in a similar way to them. And we do this by using the, the words, the structures, the kinds of argument that they're going to accept and understand. So a reader-oriented view of language emphasizes the interaction between writers and readers. Um, this means that the process of writing involves creating a text that the writer assumes the reader will understand, and the process of reading involves drawing on assumptions about what the writer is trying to do. And we, we, we've known this for, for years. This is called coherence in, in linguistics. Now, it's the unfamiliarity of the expectations, which is one main reason writing in English is so difficult for speakers of other languages, because what is seen as um, logical, engaging, relevant, coherent in writing differs across cultures. Now, culture isn't the only explanation, of course, um, but it's clear that there are different ways of organizing ideas and structuring arguments in different languages. So that research uh, suggests, for instance, that compared with many other languages, academic texts in English tend to be more explicit about their structure and purpose, that they employ more and more recent citations, that they use fewer rhetorical uh, questions, they're less tolerant of digressions, they're more cautious in making claims, they have strict conventions about subheadings, and they use um, more sentence connectors and um, uh, more explicit ways of, of, of linking the text together. Now, because of this, teachers often spend a lot of time focusing on, particularly in EAP classes, uh, which helps students to do this. They teach things like nominalization, impersonalization, collectives, hedging, metadiscourse, and so on. Now, Michael Klein argues that we can trace these features to the fact that English makes the writer responsible for clarity. So in some traditions of writing, like um, German, Korean, Chinese, Finnish, it's the reader who makes a text clear, while the writer complements the reader by not spelling everything out. But in English, it's the writer who, who has to set things out so that they can be easily understood. Now, considering readers then, largely means looking at how writing used, is used by social groups. And the concept of discourse community is important here as a way of joining texts, writers and readers together. So discourse community is a fuzzy idea, but it does um, show us something of how writing works in different disciplines and different workplaces. So it tells us, for example, that needs analysis is important because um, different communities value different uh, kinds of argument and set different writing tasks. So in the humanities 
and social sciences, analyzing and synthesizing uh, multiple sources is important. Whereas in science and technology, more activity-based skills like um, describing procedures, defining objects, um, planning solutions are needed. At the most obvious level of difference, I suppose, is Lexis. Um, this slide shows the most common content words from five university textbooks in applied linguistics and biology. And there's no overlap at all. We can see that different disciplines have completely different ways of uh, talking about the world, writing about the world, and students to need to learn completely different vocabularies. Less obviously, um, a study I did a few years ago with, with Politeer um, uh, showed that so-called universal items on Coxhead's academic word list actually have different fre frequencies and preferred meanings in different fields. So that consist means stay the same in the social sciences and comprised of in the sciences. Volume means book in applied linguistics and quantity in, in, in biology. And abstract re means remove in engineering and theoretical in the social sciences. So words which look the same have completely different meanings across fields. We also know that different fields make use of different genres. So that in their large um, scale corpus study of 30 disciplines in UK dis uh, universities, Nessie and Gardner found 13 different genre families, ranging from uh, case studies through empathy writing, methodology recounts to reports. And these differ considerably in their social purpose, their genre structures, and the networks that they form with other genres. Even in closely related fields, uh, uh, students are given very, very different texts. So Jimenez found that nursing and midwifery students write very, very different assignments. So this helps us to focus on the typical genres that disciplines require, focusing on, on, on reader uh, requirements. Now in teaching, um, a reader-oriented approach suggests uh, use, uh, using a rhetorical consciousness raising model really. The basic idea is to encourage students to reflect on their own writing and uh, help them to see how language is used by actually analyzing text. And there are various ways of doing this. I've only got time to mention two, um, the mixed genre portfolio and audience analysis. Now, Anne Johns um, advocates using a mixed genre portfolio. This is where students are asked to write a range of different genres, say an argument essay, a library project, a research-based assignment, and so on, and then collect them together for uh, assessment at the end of the course with a commentary on each one. So this is um, on the screen now is uh, uh, the instructions for a portfolio for secondary students in, in Singapore. And the commentary can encourage students to um, think about their writing and um, answer questions like, why did you organize the essay in this way? Um, what are the basic parts of, of this? What did you learn from writing it? So the portfolio then not only helps us to get a more accurate picture of students' writing um, and what they can do, but it also has a consciousness raising function by getting students to think about similarities and differences between different kinds of writing and how language you can be used to address different um, purposes. Finally, we can encourage students to analyze um, their audiences, either interviewing real readers, um, but perhaps more realistically, um, in many contexts, teachers can encourage students to think about who their readers are and what they need from a text. So this simple checklist can help sensitize students to the importance of attending to shared knowledge. So this example is a response to a letter of complaint, but it can be adapted for any kind of text. So um, the question is, what do I know about the topic? What does my reader know? What does my reader not know? And what's my reader's attitude likely to be? And thinking about this, well, um, hopefully 
help students um, be aware of what writers need from the text. Okay, um, wrapping up, I've tried to cover the main frameworks used to look at writing and uh, at the same time to argue that writing really isn't just words on a page or on a screen, nor is it the activity of isolated individuals expressing personal meanings. It's always uh, a social practice. It's always influenced by cultural and institutional and social contexts. Now, what this means for teachers um, is that we need, as far as possible, I think, to become researchers of the texts our students need, to understand what it is that they, they have to write, as far as we can tell. And then, through our classroom practices, to make the features of these texts as explicit as we possibly can to them. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, very inspiring and very insightful presentation on different approaches, different frameworks for understanding second language writing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, if you have any questions, please put your questions in a question and answer box and uh, we'll address your questions to the best of uh, our ability at, in the later part of today's session. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce the second speaker to you, Professor I.C. Lee. Just very briefly, uh, Professor I.C. Lee is professor in the Faculty of Education at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her main research interests are second language writing and also second language teacher education. So she's doing both, yeah, teacher education and also uh, second language writing. Her publications everywhere have appeared in numerous international journals, such as the Journal of Second Language Writing. That's one of the top journals in second language writing. TESOL Quarterly, that's another flagship journal. Uh, System, another big journal, and also language teaching uh, research. Uh, she was a former co-editor of the Journal of Second Language Writing and is currently principal associate editor of the Asia Pacific Education researcher. Just like Ken, I.C. Lee is also very well cited. Her citation figure is also very, very high. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, Professor I.C. Lee from the University, Chinese University of Hong Kong. I.C. Okay, thank over you. Over to you. Um, shall I share screen first to see? It yes. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, British Council for sponsoring this webinar and Willie for inviting me. And thank you, Willie, for the kind introduction. Now, um, the topic of my um, talk is motivational and empowering feedback in a writing classroom. Mm. Now, when we think about feedback, what ideas come to mind? I'd like the audience to think a bit. What ideas come to mind? Maybe you think of marking errors, providing feedback on errors, and in the literature is referred to as written corrective feedback or error feedback. You may be thinking of writing a lot of detailed comments on student texts, or you may be thinking of giving students scores or grades. Mm. While the teachers, maybe some negative emotions are evoked, like you may think that, oh, feedback, so time consuming and tiring and it's labor intensive, it's also overwhelming and demotivational, not only to, to students, but also to myself. Sometimes I really hate marking, right? Okay, so these may be some of the emotions that come up. Now, these are some um, typical concerns among Hong Kong teachers, like, oh, students lack motivation to, to, to even read my feedback, and students show frustration after receiving marked compositions. And we teachers have to give feedback on various types of grammatical errors, but students don't seem to understand them, not to mention learning from our feedback. So the interesting question is, a lot of these comments or concerns are expressed by novice as well as experienced teachers. So the question is, does experience lead to expertise as far as feedback is concerned? So do teachers get better through giving feedback day in, day out, so on and so forth? As they become more experienced in giving response to writing, do they get better? 
This is an intriguing question to me. I guess the answer is, well, they may not get better. For some of them, they think they get even worse. Well, but on the other hand, some teachers may think, oh, the longer you do something, your skills should improve. Why not? So the more papers I mark, the better I become at giving feedback. Other teachers may think, oh, as, as I gain experience, I get better. Why not? While others may say practice makes perfect. Anyway, repeat what I do in the classroom, repeat what I do in giving feedback, I consolidate my skills and then I improve. Is it true? Now, as far as feedback is concerned, maybe let's learn from Jack Richards and David Noonan. Experience alone is insufficient for professional growth. And I guess this applies not only to feedback, but to many, many others of our work as language educators. The experience coupled with reflection is a much more powerful impetus for development. So this afternoon, let's do a bit of reflection. Unfortunately, I'm not able to interact with you to find out what's going on in your mind, but let's reflect a bit. First of all, I know there are many teachers here. So are your existing feedback practices effective, especially in motivating and empowering students to learn and write? Think. Now I have included these two important concepts, motivation and empowerment. What is motivation? Motivation is a driving force that exerts influence on whether and how students set about learning tasks, how much energy they are going to invest and how long they are going to persist. So motivational feedback is the kind of feedback that provides students with an impetus so that they are willing to attend to, engage with, and act upon the feedback received, whether it's teacher feedback or peer feedback. What about empowerment? Empowerment is bringing into a state of belief one's ability to act effectively. So in providing empowering feedback, teachers have to give students some tools to allow them to participate in the feedback process as active agents of learning. We enable them to take charge of their learning and, and writing. Okay, so given the importance of motivational and empowering feedback, let's begin our reflection with a why question. Why do we do what we do when it comes to feedback? Why do you give feedback in the way you do? Do your purposes facilitate motivational and empowering feedback? So the why, let's look at the why, think about the why. Okay, do these reasons or purposes ring a bell? Oh, I'm just paid to mark student papers. I have my paycheck at the end of each month. This is my duty. Or you may think that I just don't want my students to repeat the same errors again and again. And that's one main reason I give feedback. Another purpose could be, oh, I just follow the policy of the English department. Since I'm a member, I just follow it. Or you may think one important purpose or reason is to give students a mark or grade without which students do not know how well they fare. This is quite a common purpose among Hong Kong teachers, but are there some better reasons for giving feedback? I'm going to share 10 possibly better reasons with you. And there's a plan you can think, right? To let students know whether they have got across something effectively in their writing. Okay, I'm sure you'll get this word. This is meaning. So after students have spent time producing a piece of work, they want to find out whether they have communicated their meaning clearly. So I think feedback first and foremost serves this purpose. So it's not like grammar, but meaning first. The second purpose, to make students aware of the needs of the A so that they can learn to evaluate their own writing. I think Ken mentioned this word, audience. So through feedback, students get to find out the queries, concerns, questions of an objective reader. So as a result, they become sensitized to the needs of the audience. And gradually 
Over time, they learn to evaluate their own writing. The third purpose, we provide feedback so that students have got incentives to engage in a very important activity in the writing process, and that is revision. Sometimes students complain, oh, why, why do you ask me to just copy my first draft again? I mean, if students have this feeling that they just have to copy again, it means that teacher feedback may not be very useful and constructive. But imagine if we can give very constructive feedback, very meaningful feedback to students, they can use the feedback to really revise and improve their writing. So constructive feedback provides a strong motivation for revision. The fourth purpose to help students build on their S and improve their weaknesses. So the opposite is strengths. Feedback should serve a diagnostic purpose, helping our students understand what they are good at and what they are weaker in. So this kind of awareness is very important for our student learners, student writers. Okay, number five, to motivate and encourage students and help them build now, this C word is very powerful in writing. Unfortunately, in many L2 writing classrooms, students lose confidence because of feedback. That's the opposite. But remember, it's so important to build confidence in writing through feedback. Number six, to help students make continuous in writing. This P word is, again, essential without progress, without feeling that they make progress, students are going to lose heart. They're not going to, to spend time writing. They're going to lose interest because they don't see any improvement. So feedback serves this important function. Number seven, to cater to I needs through one-on-one -on -one communication. One-on-one, -on -one, so the word is individual, yes. Feedback provides a splendid opportunity for teachers to really interact with students on an individual basis, listening to what that student has to say through writing and building a relationship, okay? Relatedly, this is establishing rapport. So through feedback, we can establish a strong relationship with students. Through giving personalized comments, we can help students um, improve their writing, we can provide further scaffolding. And such rapport is really pivotal to the success of a writing classroom. Last two purposes, to build a supportive learning atmosphere. It's important for teachers to bring home the message that it's just natural to make mistakes in writing, especially for second language student writers. So we encourage risk taking in students through our feedback. Finally, this is really a very important long-term goal. We talk a lot about learner autonomy in language education. So through feedback, we wanna help students develop into autonomous writers. We want them to be independent so that one day they can do without the teacher they can evaluate their own writing. They are assessment capable. They become autonomous writers. Okay, so I'd like you to reflect a bit. 10 purposes. Which of the above purposes does your own feedback normally serve? And which purposes could have been given a stronger emphasis to facilitate motivational and empowering feedback? You may have forgotten, so here you are, the 10 purposes again. Do these purposes guide your feedback practices? Okay, and this why question brings us naturally to the next important question. Actually, what is feedback? Is feedback just a product like, oh, it's just some information you pass on to, to someone, to your student regarding different aspects of their performance? Yes, it is. It is a product, but, it, but it's not only a product, it is also a process. It's a process through which learners make sense of information from various sources and use it to enhance their work. Now, this simple definition is short, but it contains a lot of important ideas, like it's a process. 
We don't mention teachers here. We mention students. Students play an active role to what do they do to make sense of the feedback from different sources. It's not just from teachers. It can be from peers, from students themselves, or even from technology, and use the feedback to improve their work. So a number of important ideas are included in this short definition. Feedback is not only a product, but it's also a process. And feedback, more importantly, is shared responsibility between teachers and students. And that's how and where motivation and empowerment come into the picture. Shared responsibility. We want students to be active, to do something during the feedback process. It's not just the teachers working very hard. It's also the students working hard, um, working um, um, and being very active in using feedback to, to improve their writing and learning but they have to be motivated in the first place. They have to be provided or equipped with tools. They need to be empowered to take up this responsibility. So it brings me to my next important question, the how. And the bulk of this talk is about the how. I'm gonna share 10 feedback strategies with you, which I think would be able to motivate and empower, uh, empower students. Although 10 years ago when I wrote this paper, I did not really explicitly address the motivation and empowerment issues. So I'm gonna look at each strategy one by one and give you some examples, okay? So the first strategy, an optimum amount of feedback. There is no need for teachers to respond to every single problem in student writing because why you just overwhelm and frustrate or even confuse your students of course i'm talking about average student writers i'm not talking about particularly proficient student writers with very few problems in their writing so i would suggest an optimum amount and you decide what an optimum amount means is manageable to your students for example, if you use an evaluation form or a feedback form like this one, you include the key assessment criteria, you may include a Likert scale, one, two, three, four, five, and some spaces for comments. You don't really have to um, fill every single space with lots of detailed comments. <coughs> and don't forget that on the student text, you may write some comments as well. The second strategy, I would say feedback, can be selective and focused. Why? Because then you can draw your students' attention to some specific areas in their writing which warrant attention. And usually these are the most serious problems in their writing. Now, in this part, I'm going to focus mm -hmm. on errors in particular because I know that a lot of teachers are concerned or even bothered about error feedback. Or, focus, uh, or written corrective feedback. So my suggestion is for teachers to consider giving selective feedback on errors or focused written corrective feedback. So a few slides about this. Let's think about how we are going to do it with regard to, okay, how many error types should I target? Like what error types to select and who should select, when to select and error selection based on diagnostic assessment, just very briefly. So if, if you're interested in the idea of uh, marking errors in a selective manner, number, I cannot tell you the exact number. No hard and fast rules for the number, but one key principle is whether the number is manageable for your students. In a written corrective feedback literature, people mention a mid-focused approach that is targeting about two to five which is a comfortable range or a manageable range for a lot of students. Because like beyond five, if you target, well, seven or eight different error types, it may be a bit hard even for the teachers to remember which seven or which eight, all right? And don't forget that the number can vary during the course, during the academic year, or even based on stu different student needs. <coughs> what error types to select? There are multiple considerations. The target types can be linked to your pre-writing instruction, your grammar syllabus, 
or more importantly to the genre, the target genre. Let's say you are asking students to write a recount or a story, then you may target verb tense because um, students have to use a past tense. And for a lot of student writers, they may have problem using the past tense correctly. And you may target time markers or time expressions, how students link up to different events in the story or in the recount. Other considerations in general could include the following, like, oh, should I target mistakes or errors? In general, errors um, indicate some gaps in students' knowledge, whereas for mistakes, these may be careless mistakes um, and, and there are slips. And generally speaking, errors require teacher intervention. Some errors are local, others are more global in nature. So global errors, they are more meaning related. In a way, they, they deserve more attention, but they are also harder for students to fix, especially for students of lower language proficiency. So you have to prioritize a bit. Some errors are treatable, they are rule governed, like articles agreement, whereas other errors are less treatable, they are untreatable, like vocab errors right, or expression errors. Okay. You may consider whether you should use small error categories or larger error categories. Like if I take sentence structure as an example, sentence structure is a relatively large category, whereas comma splice or, or sentence fragments, these are smaller error categories. Okay, who should select errors and when should you do it? Who? who? Teachers, why not, right? But students can also be empowered to select their own errors. So on top of the few target error types selected by the teacher, students can be encouraged to request certain errors or certain error types for feedback. I mean, they, they can request feedback on specific error types that they think they are not good at. When? Before students start writing, before you plan your writing unit, you start thinking about the target error type, so pre-selection. But when you are responding to student writing, you may find some recurring error patterns, high frequency errors, or even stigmatizing errors. Although these are not selected by you as the target error types, you can still respond to those errors. Why not? So flexibility is important. For example, we have taught them not to write their heads, their head, their head many, many times. They still, they still produce this sort of sentence. So you may want to respond to this um, error. Okay. Error selection can be done based on diagnostic assessment if you are interested. So how do you do it? On day one in September, maybe, you administer a timed in-class writing task at the beginning of the course or the year, and then you, you gather evidence about your students' written errors through performing a pretty detailed error analysis. So in other words, you provide comprehensive written corrective feedback. For example, this is an error analysis sheet or error ratio uh, sheets that you give each individual student. So, um, you list all the important error types, and then you count the total number of errors, 20 for this student, and this student has made errors in different categories, and then you have the number. The error ratio is worked out very easily. Four verb tense errors over 20, so it's 0 0.2. If you look at the um, error ratios, the biggest number is 0 0.4. So in terms of ranking, this is number one. So this student has made a lot of errors in articles in determiner. So imagine you have 30, 40, 50 students in your class, you can compile the statistics and you can have a class error analysis sheets for the whole class. And these results could guide your error selection. I emphasize could, because one caveat is that student errors may vary with text type. So if you ask students to write an argumentative essay, they're likely to use a present tense, so they may not have a lot of tense errors. Okay, number three, diagnostic feedback. Diagnostic meaning strengths, weaknesses. What about telling <clears throat> each essay? A couple of major strengths, as well as a couple of major areas for improvement. Not every problem, but some um, more serious problems that deserve attention or follow up. So here's an example. You could write a few 
major strengths in a very specific manner, like, like in this um, example here, the teacher role, oh, the introduction is very good, blah, blah, blah. It's very specific about the well-formed thesis. And the essay is well-researched, great insight, but, you know, uh, yeah, not but, not that but. And this is a strength. Since I pointed out the article error, I, I can see you have improved a lot in your use of articles. So improvement here, as well as a couple of areas for improvement, like the three arguments, so very specific, the conclusion, no good, and then um, non ending errors, also code for you. So very specific, major strengths, major areas for improvement. And diagnostic feedback can pinpoint written accuracy as well. So for example, if you want to encourage students, there may be a few um, expressions which are particularly well used. Felicitous expressions, you can put an asterisk or you know, circle with them, it's up to you. And as long as you make it clear to your students. And recurring error patterns, the most serious error types color coded, maybe prepositions in yellow, articles in green, something like that. Number four balanced coverage. Apart from written corrective feedback, it's important for teachers to provide feedback on other important dimensions of writing like content, organization, and genre issues. That's for sure, okay? In order to help teachers do this, I strongly suggest teachers consider using an evaluation form or a feedback form to deliver your balanced feedback. Why? Because if you just mark, mark, mark on a student text, sometimes we are too preoccupied with delivering comments on errors. So with a feedback form, you include all the important um, uh, evaluation criteria that focus on different aspects of writing, like the content and structure, organization, and some language features. So this sort of feedback form can serve as a good reminder. It can guide teachers writing instruction and guide the assessment and feedback at the same time. Okay, motivational feedback is of course constructive, not destructive. Constructive feedback is concrete, text specific, not vague and not too generic, okay? And preferably such comments are written with reference to the success criteria you have established early on. So you don't surprise or shock your students with some new comments or some big words that they don't understand. And it's important to provide comments that are action oriented, actionable, so that students read your comments, they use your comments to revise their drafts. Some examples here, some generic or vague comments versus some more text specific comments like, oh, nice beginning, interesting opening. What about an attention grabbing beginning with the use of a proverb, okay? And this teacher wrote this because in the pre-writing instruction, the teacher has reinforced the idea of or the importance of providing an attention grabbing opening in a good story and also share some strategies like the use of a proverb or a dialogue and so on. Well organized, too generic, clearly discernible structure that follows a problem solution rhetorical pattern. And this is a pattern you have taught before students started writing. Inappropriate ending. Students who get this will be at a loss. How inappropriate? I don't know. But you can say you end abruptly without using any appropriate discourse marker. Need to signal to the reader that the essay is coming to an end. Okay, and this is what you have taught, probably. So you're not going to give your students any new surprise in, in the written comments. So some action-oriented comments in the right column, but let's look at the problem-oriented comments, which are very common. The events in your story are just connected all over the place. Okay, do plan your story more logically. Sometimes we are quite angry. We sort of uh, vent out our anger, but these comments do not really help students. Look at the action-oriented or actionable comments. Like, oh, I challenge you to develop this story idea further by having a small problem that happened during the celebration in your story, but could be solved easily and quickly. So you give that particular student a hint or an idea or a suggestion. 
please rephrase the last part where a lesson is learned. What was the lesson learned? Make it very clear to the reader. So this is action oriented. The student read, can read it and think and use this comment to improve the story. Okay, I think motivational and empowering feedback is surely student-centered and student-specific. What I mean is we use our feedback to cater to students' individual needs. Every student is different. And teachers could vary their feedback according to the strengths and weaknesses of individual students. For example, you may wonder, should I use an imperative when I write a comment or should I use a hedge, should I ask a question? In general, weaker students may benefit from more imperatives. Like give one more example here. Instead of why don't you give one more example? or you might give one more example. For stronger students, you may use more questions to help them think. And we can also give feedback that responds to students' specific requests, as I mentioned earlier. For example, we can encourage students to include a cover sheet when they submit their writing. And on the cover sheet, they can include the goals they set as well as some requests like, oh, I'd like to receive feedback on the expressions highlights in yellow. Maybe a couple of expressions that students have used, but they're not sure of. And please also respond to the following error types. This is optional. Maybe the, the te teachers have selected two or three error types, but in addition to those two or three, students can uh, make special requests about additional error types if they want to. And this will only work in a classroom that emphasizes explicit grammar instruction, of course. If students have no idea about what articles mean or what prepositions are, it's really hard for them to come up with uh, such kind of request. Or you may um, allow students to write annotations, maybe two at maximum or three in their text. So next to their writing, they can write their query. Is it last but not the least or last but not least? Well, I just repeat my thesis in the conclusion. Can you suggest how I can rephrase my thesis? So by doing this, by asking questions and thinking about their own writing, students develop a stronger sense of ownership of their own writing. Okay, encouraging feedback is motivational for sure. I think it's important to build a sort of positive atmosphere in the classroom where you keep telling students that making mistakes it's just okay, no worries. As long as you try your best, okay, it's okay. It's all right to make mistakes. Praise students where appropriate, but avoid empty praise. Like, well done, right? Good job, right? I know that sometimes I also say something like this, but it's important that students know what they did well, okay? So good job may be followed by another more specific compliment. Now, if you want to give encouraging feedback, you can design your feedback forms that include can do statements, especially for younger learners, like I can do this, I can do that. So you focus on the positive, I can, right? Even, even though I may get a tool for this statement, I can still do it, but not very well. Okay, feedback that is empowering. Invo involve students, make them active, encourage them to take responsibility for their learning, but they need some tools. For example, you can ask students to set goals and monitor and evaluate the goals throughout the writing process or even throughout the writing course. They set goals for each piece of writing based on the success criteria and the learning goals you establish in the pre-writing stage. Okay, what I did well, what I did less well, what I can do to improve my writing next time. Students can also utilize different tools to monitor and improve their own writing. If you provide diagnostic assessment, if you provide error analysis sheets, error ratio sheet, then they can keep an error log to log to track the number of errors they make in different error categories that you emphasize in your class to find out their written accuracy development. They can also do self-evaluation by looking at their goals. So they juxtapose 
the original goals they set for story writing. And then after receiving feedback from teacher and peers, they self-reflect and they write some reflective notes on each and every um, goal they have set earlier. Okay. So for example, I'm not going to read aloud. For example, the last one, the goal is, oh, I, I, my goal is to use appropriate dialogue to make my characters come to life. Okay, so after getting all the feedback, I think I overused dialogue in your story. It was a bit confusing, especially in the middle of the story. I will remember that more is not better. So this is from that student's reflection. Okay, they can also use technological tools, like some freely available tools to check their writing. But we have to remind students that these tools are free some are easier to use, they have, they have to try them out and students can pro, uh, teachers can provide training, but the reminder is that they don't provide perfect solutions. So the useful thing to do for teachers is to encourage students to undertake guided discovery with the help of a corpus, okay? When they're not sure, this is called data-driven learning. For example, when we are writing, we may have a lot of questions like students may ask, oh, is it hang on, is it I concerned that or I am concerned that? Is it the news is shocking, the news are shocking? Is it keep abreast of or keep abreast with? As a second language writer myself, when I was a student, I always had a lot of questions, but in my generation, no internet. So they can go to, for example, British National Corpus, freely available. You can show them how to do it. Then they type, I concerned that or oh, no, nothing, no return, but I am concerned that, oh, lots of returns, so, oh, this is the correct version. So they can even read the examples to find out how this expression is used in context. So this is self-discovery. Another tool is peer feedback. I know that in a lot of classrooms, peer feedback, if done, it is done mechanically and perfunctorily. Some students do it to please the teacher, but I would suggest if you do it, you take it seriously, you provide coaching, you can provide a template. So red and green, the student writer will be active. The student writers do not wait passively for comments and then say, thank you. The student writers will look at the goals, the first goal, maybe, have I included a very interesting story opening? Oh, may I have your feedback on my story opening? This is my first goal. The peer reviewer will say something like, I know this sounds a bit mechanical too, but it's just a suggestion. Starting with something positive, you did well on something, but this part needs to be changed because of this, and you can improve it by, so giving a constructive suggestion. And the student writer should be encouraged to engage in negotiation of meaning, especially when they are not clear. Can you clarify or explain a bit more and then the peer reviewer will clarify and explain. And this is a cycle, okay? So the peer feedback will go on in this manner. Number nine, feedback that is perspective. We, we use feedback to help, to help students look ahead, to think ahead, to think about how they can further improve, how to close the gaps in their writing. So some follow-up is definitely needed. Some follow-up, like follow-up on the part of your students, they do revision. Follow-up on your part as a teacher, you provide post-writing grammar reinforcement, post-writing editing exercises, or a follow-up writing instruction. So feedback is also feed forward. For example, you notice that students have a lot of sentence structure problems, sentence fragments, run-ons, and comma splices. It may even be better if this Editing sheet consists of only one category, sentence fragments, all sentence fragments. So, so they practice. Okay, finally, feedback that integrates teaching, learning, and assessment. So that all these three things, teaching, learning, and assessment, they are closely related. Our feedback relates directly to our instructional input, the success criteria and the learning goals. Okay, and um, students set goals based on these success criteria. Our feedback relates to these success criteria. So the teaching and the assessment, they are closely aligned. What is assessed becomes what is valued, which becomes what is taught. 
So I would suggest teachers think of feedback in terms of three stages, pre, while, post. Before feedback, do think about your feedback philosophy, share it with your students explicitly. Design, choose good writing tasks and make sure that you include very clear task specific criteria for writing and you provide training in peer feedback and self-evaluation and yet you let students set their goals. And while feedback, you focus on the message. Don't be preoccupied with the errors. Be encouraging, you diagnose, tell students their strengths, a few strengths, mm. a few major areas of improvement, use feedback to motivate students and you involve students actively in the feedback process. After feedback, you talk to students if possible, have conferences, you encourage students to reflect on the goals and set further goals. You let them act on the feedback received, of course, through multiple drafting and use feedback to inform teaching. Finally, some questions for your self-reflection. Any good feedback practices you want to keep? Some which are not that effective, what do you want to improve? What do you want to change to motivate and empower students to play a more active role? Mm. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Aisi Lee. That was very, very insightful and uh, extremely useful for me as well. I think I'll be using your slides for my own teaching at some point. Okay. And also Ken Highland's uh, slides that I can steal some of the ideas there. Some questions for you. Uh, first, for Ken Highland, mm. uh, you mentioned the three approaches to teaching writing: the product-based, the process, and the uh, and the reader-oriented approach. Uh, if I understand correctly, you are not recommending the first approach, the uh, product-oriented type of approach to teaching writing, but. I was thinking of, of a situation where we are dealing with adult students, ESL students, they're mature writers, they can write in their own language. What they need in the writing class actually is how to improve on their language you know, bit of writing. So do you have any comment on that? Is, that, is it something that you can you know, sort of use with this group of you know, students? They know how to write already in their own language, yeah? Um, oh, right. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, um, writing classes have often been um, disguised grammar classes, you know, right. so that a lot of teachers <clears throat> feel that the way to teach grammar is to <clears throat> get students to write it down. That might not be the best way. You know, if you want to help your students Im improve their language accuracy, they <clears throat> might more effective ways of doing it than, mm. than getting them to, to write long, you know, essays or whatever. Right, right. Um, yeah. So I think, um, you know, for writing, we're, we're really thinking about appropriate grammar. You know, what is what is the, the right uh, or the most effective way of putting an idea down in, uh, in a written form, um, you know, that's going to have the most impact, that's going to do mm. what you want with, with a particular audience. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, um, you know, I wouldn't use writing as a, as a way of teaching grammar because it, mm. I mean, I think that's why a lot of students get turned off writing because they right, see it right. as grammar yeah. practice, you know. Mm. Um, you know, they might as well be writing um, correct sentences, you know, in, in mm. you know, one after the other. So, um you know, maybe we should be encouraging students to to see a particular purposes of writing and the, the, the features that they need to do that mm. well. Yeah, mm. thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, another sort of related question. Uh, now, this has to do with the teacher teaching academic writing. Uh, are we making the assumption that if you were to teach in you know, academic writing, then you yourself should be somebody who is quite good at you know, doing that kind of stuff. Uh, this is a real question from, from you know, some yeah. of the uh, audience. Yeah, I had a look at the, um, at yeah. the, the Q&A questions. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a good question, but I think, I mean, as teachers, we we have a responsibility to understand language, right? And I think right. yeah. we have um, a responsibility to understand the text that we're asking our students to write. Mm. So this doesn't mean being a great writer. 
It means being um, someone who can um, unpack a text. You know, see, what is yeah. what are the main things that this this mm. what makes this text work? Um, mm. How is it organized? What are the what are the way? You know, what kind of language does it use? Um, right. Yeah. So I think that's a that's a basic teacher's job. Um, mm. It doesn't doesn't mean to say you've got to be you know um, uh, J.K. Rowling or something. You know you mm. can. Um, or Ken yeah. Highland. <laughs> <laughs> it, it means you know <laughs> being able to um, you know to yeah. to to understand uh, text and mm. language. I think that's why we become teachers. I mean because right. we're interested in students, but also because mm. we're interested in language. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the uh, yeah. for the answers. Very, uh, very good answers. Excellent answers. Uh, let me let me turn to Icy uh, about feedback. Uh, Icy, what do you think about? I think you mentioned a lot of ways to provide feedback, but uh, in my mind, I think you were referring mainly to the kind of paper and pencil type of feedback that teachers normally give. Yeah, you write comments on, on students' writing and things like that. What do you think about uh, tech-mediated uh, mm. feedback? Uh, I mean, for one, you know, there's a lot of you know tools available uh, these days, uh, including Grammarly, which is very popular, and uh, also the other possibility of providing audio feedback yeah. to our students or yeah. even video feedback. I think there's a lot of applications that you can easily use to, to, to provide audio or video feedback. Uh, has there been any research looking at the oh, yes. uh, for know, sure. impact yes. of this? Yeah. Well, more research on um, technology enhanced or supportive feedback, for sure. Hmm. But I want to say, I think that um, technology cannot replace the human teacher. Absolutely. So yeah. technology, Otherwise, we are redundant, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, it's not because we want to keep our job, but I think the human teacher, the, hu the human teacher is so mm. valuable, you know? Yes. Technology can help. Mm. And Grammarly can help. It also depends on the student's levels, proficiency mm. levels, motivation. Like, for example, if I look at Hong Kong secondary students, Grammarly may be too, too much. Mm. For them, right? It's too dense and it's yeah. not, it can be demotivating. It can mm. be demotivating. Rating. It really depends who the student is, right? So, right. Um, so I think like audio feedback. Why not screencast feedback? I've done it before. You can you can audio record your feedback. Right. You can yes. use different apps to give feedback. Mm. But I think the more important thing is to introduce some apps or some tools to students so that they can do it before they submit. Mm. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Excellent so point. Sharing responsibility. Yeah. Yes. Share responsibility with technology. Share mm. responsibility with the teacher yes. and the peers. Yeah. Mm. Good. Yes. Uh, I see you mentioned about the importance of keeping a balance between, you know, giving uh, feedback on students' strengths and also weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. In your experience, do teachers pay attention mostly to students' weaknesses or their strengths? Is that... Is it usually the case that teachers, you know, pay more attention to what the students are not able to do, what the students cannot do, instead of what the students can do? Yes. Your advice? Yeah. I think especially maybe in the Chinese society, maybe mm. students always say, oh, tell me my weakness. How can I improve? Mm. They seldom come to you and ask, what did I do well? Really? Yeah. Right. So mm. I think we, my, my suggestion is, Remember that slide about major strengths, major areas for improvement. Yes. So if, if this is something you put down, you, you may have a sheet, a form with these sections. So mm. you, you, you force yourself, even though you think this piece of writing, oh no, no good. I'm mm. sure you can find something which is pretty okay or pretty good. So okay. praise the effort mm. or sometimes even the handwriting for, for, for a primary student writing. Mm piece of writing, so on and so forth. So make sure we start with something positive. And in the feedback form, mm. there's a scale, one, two, three, four. Some you may take four or three and you could put a nice comment. So compliments, mm. yeah. So it's more balanced than, yeah. Good, thank you for that. Uh, Ken, what is the role of practice uh, in, you know, writing eventually is, is a skill and you need a lot of practice. You need daily kind of writing 
mm. you have to write on a daily basis and then you know hopefully one day you become good <laughs> in writing in addition to <laughs> learning from you know some of the things that you mentioned <laughs> yeah i mean i think um you know writing right i think writing does improve with with repetition and practice but yeah. you can't you can't learn to write by just writing you know okay. i mean one of the one of the um reasons that the genre model took off um mm. was uh in in australian primary schools because they, yeah. they found that the kids were writing their science reports as stories because mm. that was the only way they knew how to write right. and so um getting them to structure you know mm. the content that they had about science as um as a report was was an important step forward so you know they could have continued writing stories forever but their writing um would not improve for the purposes that they needed it so so i think um yeah yeah i mean writing but writing um with some understanding of of mm. of what works you know of the structure uh, that they need to present it in yeah it's a good question though um yeah mm. yeah okay so, yeah so yeah okay so so once they know the rules of writing for example writing a science text uh what is what is the role of practice in writing science text to what extent the students need to do a lot of practice in writing science text until eventually they become very good at it yeah i'm sorry i'm um, pushing the idea for yeah, you know no, skill I, development I, yeah i guess um i mean i guess you mean practice in terms of um doing it yeah i mean yeah. but if it, it it means doing it in a way that's going to work you know if yes. you keep repeating errors Mm. you know if you keep repeating things in a way that, that yep. is not effective then you're not mm. going to improve but of course Agreed. if you yes. if you have some um idea mm. of how um a text is uh, usefully structured then then that's going to take you forward then that's going to improve your Agreed. writing yes um so mm. I, I i you know just writing um and, and hoping that you, it's going to get better is is not Is, is not really going to work and I, I do think okay. that a lot of teachers worry too much about mm. imposing prescriptive models on students they worry more about students being um mm. uh, having these models pushed on them right. than they do about students becoming better writers you know mm. and uh, um it, it, it it's it's a, a a gradual process you know students right. need to know how things look before mm. they can Uh, start making modifications to that. So, um, yeah, yeah, mm, good. Yeah, I, yes. thanks for the question. Yes. Now, this is a question for both of you. Uh, mm. Both of you are at the forefront of research in second language writing. Uh, some of the questions that people have in the audience is, what area of research is still trendy, still you know productive area of research? I, I know these are questions from maybe from graduate students or PhD students who are dying to find a topic within you know writing uh maybe feedback any okay. area that you think is you know still you know uh important for people to take it one one step further go on i see i see okay, okay. <laughs> if i okay let me talk about feedback I know that a lot of people are saying you are still researching feedback. Come on, yes, Sensation, right? Mm. Look, recently I, um, with my former PhD student, we have a special issue for assessing writing mm. about feedback literacy. Mm. Wow, we received so many abstracts, very good abstracts, and different ideas. So feedback literacy, emotions mm. in feedback. These are relatively newer areas for investigation. Mm. Um, people even think about peer feedback literacy. <laughs> right. Um, so different kinds of literacy. So mm. I, I, I would have thought that, yeah, still, even for feedback, there are still a number of exciting areas to, to mm. delve into to further right. explore. Yes. Can you, can you mention one or two? Like, yes. I just mentioned a few. I thought. Oh, oh, okay. So <laughs> this assessment is it? Feedback literacy. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Okay, literacy. Yeah. Feedback okay. literacy. How, how okay. students develop their their, their liter literacy even when they do peer feedback. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I got it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. What about what about writing in general, Ken? Uh, um, is there any particular area that you think is worth I, I, you know I, I further see exploration? People writing um, 
you know, in the literature, um, more and more uh, uh, different genres, you know, Ted's mm-hmm. talks, um, uh, yeah. three minute theses, you know, um, um, uh, uh, blogs. Um, I think there's, there's a, a big area that's currently unmapped in um, uh, writing online, you know, collaborative mm. writing like wikis. Yes, um, yes. And there are Blog. Um, yeah. And blogs, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Um, and um, a lot of teachers do use wikis and, um, mm. you know, because it does help focus students and it, it does give this, this peer uh, feedback and, and collaborative mm. writing, um, which is useful. Um, so I think there's, there's, you know, work on that. And, and teachers in their own classrooms, you know, can, can look at, you know, does this work? I mean, mm. um, uh, many, many years ago, John Fanslow wrote a book called uh, Try the Opposite. And what he suggested was that if, if a teacher is doing something again and again and again, why not do it differently? You know, give give um, give a, a different uh, kind of uh, pre-writing, you know, in, in, instead of uh, free writing, give give them clustering or, or mind mapping or whatever. Does that make a difference? So there's 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 classroom research that can be done. There's mm. um, genre research that can be done. And um um, I think the you know the the uh, the internet um, and the um, uh, people's experiences of writing in different domains you know in publishing in business writing in in in, mm. in science in, um, in 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 commerce what you know what, what do people feel about their writing and what do they feel works you know and how mm. does this um, map up against what they actually do and mm. what kind of texts are successful yeah, yeah there's um oh, i mean it looks mm. like you know everything has been researched and and that is frustrating for uh, for phd students and yes. um, potential you know people who want to do research but mm. you know there's there's <clears throat> there's a lot out there. Out there. <laughs> yeah yeah but i think uh, there's still yes. some new areas like in mm. recent years more and more people have been become interested in collaborative writing Mm. And one of students is working on a very interesting area. She is finishing. I think it's okay to share the topic. Conflict in, you know, peer interaction during collaborative writing. Very interesting. So mm. um, I think there are still new areas to explore, new frontiers to explore. Like mm. I myself personally am very interested in writing teacher education and writing teacher development. I find this area very, very fascinating. So if you are interested in teacher mm. education, you can mm. explore. Mm. Teacher knowledge, writing teacher knowledge. Mm. And writing teacher expertise, all these areas, I think, are worth exploring. Good. Mm. Okay. So there are a lot of yeah. you know, uh, areas that people can yeah. you know, continue hopeful. to explore, yeah. uh, both in the area of feedback and also on the area of writing, different text types, different um, yeah. genre. Ken, you mentioned in one of the slides about the uh, gradual release of responsibility or the mm. uh, curriculum cycle from modeling yeah. you know, uh, and then yeah. deconstruction. Uh, yeah. joint uh, construction and independent construction. Can you s- comment a little bit on the uh, importance on the role of modeling? How important is modeling? If, mod- if modeling is so important, how much modeling do we need to do? Yeah, I think t- yeah. T- students need to need to see what a, what a, a good text looks like. You Absolutely. know, very yeah. often with, with the, yeah. the process approach, they don't, they don't start with that. You know, they, they start with right. a blank sheet and yeah. and some ideas about content. So, mm. you know, how are the students going to, you know, what does it look like when it's finished? And right. what, are yeah. the, what are the features that are going to make mm. that text work? Yeah. So modelling is really important. And, mm. you know, people say that we students need a, a, a good de- grip of language before they can get to that point. But... Um, yeah. There's something called writing frames that that, mm. that Ray and Lewis um, created, you know, 30 years ago, where um, you know basic structures um, mm. are provided to students. You know, what is the t- uh, so for um, an argumentative essay, um, right. the topic is or mm. uh, for yes. against conclusion. You know, mm. and, and so to get students away from and then and then and then and then, you know, th- so that there is a um, yeah. A, a way of uh, they can present their ideas, which mm. is, you know, which, which yeah. is, I mean, starting with a blank sheet or a blank mm. screen is, is very difficult. It's very difficult. demoralizing. I agree. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes. 
Uh, now, one last question for both of you. Uh, plagiarism is mm. a big topic, you know. Uh, teachers are very often concerned about students just copying and pasting whole text from the internet. Uh, what would your take on that? You know, pedagogically, especially for kids who are still at the very, very early stage when they don't have a lot of language to write. Is that mm. something that you would encourage? Maybe copying first? Just like, you know, in the apprenticeship model of learning that I'm sure you know about this model. Uh, the very first step that the apprentice does is to copy basically, to follow exactly what the master does. Mm. And then only gradually, once they have, you know, become acclimatized or develop some knowledge, then they start doing things on their own and eventually creating their own craft. So what is the role of copying? Would you call that it, plagiarizing? I guess it depends what you're copying. I mean, I, yeah. I learned to, to write academic papers by, mm. by reading academic papers. And Absolutely. I used to yeah. highlight phrases that I liked, mm. you know, things that I thought were, were, you know, really effective that linked bits of text or, or uh, yes. presented, presented ideas effectively. And mm. so, and then I started to use them. I mean, I guess that's plagiarism. Um, yes. But, you know, but it, it is a, a very difficult area because when you start mm. copying content, then that's when, you know, when, when learning stops because mm. uh, this, what is the student benefiting from, right. you know, taking stuff from the internet or, or yeah. uh, paying people to write essays for them or whatever, you know, that's, mm. that's not learning. So um, I think there is a lot to be learned from um, uh, what good writers do. And, um, and, and, and that's not, you know, for me, that's not, not plagiarism. Um, yeah. But it, it, you know, with, with the ease of, of transferring text, um, mm. it, it's difficult to know, um, you know, it's difficult to catch and it's difficult to know what the, um, um, you know, where, when the text is finished, you know, mm. maybe you're just continuing a text that's, uh, that someone else thinks is finished, you know, um, yeah. I, I, but, but as teachers, I think we should be concerned with, with yeah. are our students learning anything? Mm. Yeah. I see. Your, okay. Your take on that? I think for me, there's so much to learn from modeling on the works of good writers, but I don't yes. call it copying. Mm -hmm. um, as a second language writer myself, I learned a lot from, I learned a lot from Ken's work. I like his works a lot. I, yeah, truly, yeah. So I, I learned from different writers. So I learned, mm -hmm. but I do not plagiarize. I think right. it's important to teach, to mm -hmm. provide plagiarism education because it's part of academic honesty. Yeah. Right? But I think um, for some students, there are some better reasons to plagiarize, maybe some mm. good due to ignorance. Some, they want to cheat. Yes. Because we have to talk to students to <laughs> find like out. a shortcut, yes. yes. You know? So we yeah. have to find out the reasons and mm. help them. But uh, as a general rule, I think yeah. it's important to teach like paraphrasing, citations, yeah. all these things. Mm. Yes. Finally, this is final, final thing. A piece of <laughs> advice for the audience, those who are into writing, those who are into teaching writing, what would be your advice? Okay, I go first. Okay. <laughs> write. <laughs> write. <laughs> you have to write. Yes, I like that, yes. Yeah. Yes. People learn to read by reading. People learn to yeah. write. By if writing, write, yes, I like that. Why some teachers right. just write the materials for their students, write report mm. parts, write comments. That's it. Yeah. They don't write. They hate mm. writing. How come? Right? Yes. So write. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. Um, Ken? Uh, read. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I would you know, say that I, too. Yes. I, I think um, you know the. the, the the, the more you read, the more you understand, you know, it doesn't have to be dense academic text, but yeah. the kind of things that the students might might be useful, like what is it they need to write? Do they need to write argumentative essays mm. or lab reports or yeah. blogs? What is it, you know? And then the more you read, the more you understand that kind of text and the better writer you yourself become and the better teacher right. you. Mm. So yeah, uh, read. 
Yes. <laughs> Great advice. I like that. You know, read and write. That's the way to go. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think mean we have it. Come. Yeah, serious. Right, yeah, really serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. You, you, uh, teachers yeah. don't become better teachers by, by you know, uh, just standing in a classroom. You know, they, right. they have to do things to improve their skills. So everything yeah. you do is, is professional development, you know, every time. I agree. Teacher. Absolutely. And for those yeah. interested in second language writing research, don't just read the papers. You have to yeah. write, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Ken, and thank you so much, IC, for the wonderful, yeah. wonderful presentations and also the excellent, insightful conversations uh, during the Q and A uh, session. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please give the two speakers a big round of applause again. Clap, 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 everyone. <laughs> Uh, the uh, the uh, e-certificate is available. I think the link is available in the chat box. Uh, please fill in the survey form first, and afterwards you'll be able to download the uh, e-certificate and also the uh, presentation slides, the PDF uh, presentation slides of the two speakers. Uh, Maria, are you there? I'm now inviting Maria from the British Council to say one or two words of gratitude to the uh, audience. Maria, please. Thank you, Pak Willy. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Maria Arsandi. I'm the program manager of the English team of British Council Indonesia. Um, we have come to the last session of the ELT Today series, and on behalf of British Council Indonesia, I would like to say thank you. Um, first of all, to our amazing host, Pak Willy, for developing, delivering, and um, hosting this amazing series for the past month. Um, we are very pleased that through this series, we are able to virtually reach many teachers, not only from Indonesia, but also from across the regions and um, connect them with such amazing um, lineup of ELT experts. Um, British Council had these initiatives because we wanted to provide opportunities for teachers to learn directly from experts across the world to support them improve their classrooms. And I believe, Pak Willy, you have successfully helped us achieve that. So um, thank you very much. And um, with that, I'd also like to thank all the amazing speakers who have shared their skills, expertise, and experience throughout this series. It has been a great experience to learn directly from you, from all, this, uh, from all the experts. We have heard from the surveys how the sessions have been very useful and insightful. So thank you very much to all the speakers. And of course, last but not least, thank you very much to everyone who's been following this series from across the world. We have many teachers joining, not only from Asia, but also from the UK, from the America. Thank you for sharing your weekend with us. Uh, we hope that this series has been useful and enjoyable for you. Um, we encourage you to take as much as possible from this series to help you improve your classrooms. And we hope that this series can benefit your students as well. Mm. Um, the recordings of this series are available, available on the yeah. Council Indonesia's YouTube channel. So please share it to your fellow teachers and feel free to visit the recordings anytime to refresh your memory or to get new tips that you can try in your classrooms. So yeah, please share it um, to your fellow teachers. I think that is all from me. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Pak Willy, for hosting this amazing thank series. You. Thanks to all the speakers, moderators, and everyone who has been following this series, both on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, so I think this is all from me. Goodbye, and we will see you next time. Thank you. See and you again. Bye-bye, really. everyone. Thank you. Bye. See you. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. Uh, bye, thanks. Ken. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. 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 bye, Willie. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Under the broad theme of uh, English language teaching today, uh, opportunities and challenges. And to think about how these modes can be used to reflect their identities as well as the ideas that they have. With my English composition class where students write and then make it beautiful or multimodal, 
and then we publish it in the digital magazine. And ultimately, uh, multimodal literacy is about helping students as well as teachers to recognize the way meanings are made differently across different semiotic words. I think we need to teach them both together and we need to get the students to experience, to be exposed to a lot of examples of how these patterns are encountered. If they can read something quickly and enjoyably with adequate comprehension, they don't need a dictionary, then they're reading extensively. There's no other way. You have to learn how words and grammar go together and get that sense of language. Are the real life tasks that they have to do in their daily life in these places, etc. And then we would base our tasks on the target tasks that we've identified. We can see that technology is a big part of this because in every single stage of this work plan, technology plays a role. Task-based language teaching, you don't have to make a complete switch from intentional learning to task-based language learning. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.